Hello, my name is Jonathan Stalling. I'm the curator of the Chinese Literature Translation Archive and the Newman Chair for U.S.-China Issues here at the University of Oklahoma. And it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to uh, a recent acquisition of our archive, the work uh, as a translator of Stephen Bradbury. Now, before I introduce Steve, I want to say a little bit about the Translation Archive. Here at the University of Oklahoma, we collect the work of translators, um, beginning with Arthur Whaley in the early 20th century to the mid-20th century, also Howard Goldblatt, Wolfgang Kubin, Wilhelm Yip, Brian Holton, uh, Steve Bradbury, Andrea Lingenfelter, among others. And what is an archive? This is the, all the texts that a translator produces when they're working on a translated work of fiction or poetry. So that can include letters or correspondence with the authors or with peer reviewers. It can also include the draft material where they're working through the translation. It can include their source books that might be annotated. And all of these materials taken together allow scholars to come in and get a feeling for the process of translation, not just a final product like a commodity, but actually a whole life world and ecology of world literature, if you will. And so today we'll be hearing uh, about Steve Bradbury's work, which focuses primarily on contemporary Taiwanese women writers. And, you know, I'm hoping that if you're hearing this video, you'll have a chance to come and experience this exhibit where he has on display his work on a number of contemporary Taiwanese poets. Xiaoyu, Amang, and Ye Mimi are the ones who he'll be speaking about today. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Steve Bradbury. Steve is a translator, an artist, a visual artist, a graphic, um, he works in graphite illustration, and he holds a PhD from English, of English literature from the University of Hawaii. And he's lived for over 20 years in Taiwan, collecting, collaborating with, and translating the poets who we'll be hearing about this afternoon. The lecture's title is Translating uh, Contemporary Chinese, or Taiwanese Poetry and uh, Material Culture, because the material culture of, of Taiwan is very particular in ways we'll get a, a sense of how the poet uh, producing other things than just books, or books in different kinds of formats. And so we'll invite everyone here to, to spend some time to hold the objects and experience the book, not just as a conduit of information, but as an art object, as a historical object as well. And uh, this will be a part of an exhibit that will be continued throughout the year called uh, Translating, or uh, Taiwan Literature in Translation at the University of Oklahoma. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Steve Bradbury. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, seven is great. That's a lucky number. That's how many in the audience. Uh, you know, I, I actually used to translate male poets as well as female poets, but uh, they either passed away or they were unwilling to work remotely because I've lived in the United States since 2015 when I moved back, retired from my job and moved back. Um, I will talk a little bit about the poets that I translate, but I'm more interested in the material culture side of it, Taiwanese poetry and material culture. The technological crisis that emerged uh, just about the time I arrived there. I was very fortunate to arrive in the late 90s. Uh, that's when I got hired by uh, National Central University. And it was a very interesting moment in Taiwan. It, everyone in Taiwan was going online. They were among the first developed countries to really go digital. I mean, long before Americans had cell phones, they had cell phones. Grandmas had cell phones. Everyone had cell phones. So they were they were going online, and um, this created like I mean like all popular technological innovations, it created a kind of crisis among those who were working in more conventional uh, technologies, and among these included the poets. Um, I'll give you an historical example. Um, like when photography emerged in. Well, really, 1839, daguerreotype published the, te the complete technique for making a daguerreotype film, I mean, uh, you know, uh, photograph. And he published it, and, it, and immediately people made copies all over the world, and within two or three years you had daguerreotype-style uh, photography studios in every important country in the world. Um, every major city had uh, photography studios within three years. Now, prior to that time, painting was really what was used to represent the, the visual world, what we see. But like a portrait painter, for example, I mean, that was the largest source of income for, for professional painters was to make portraits of people. 
but why would you pay somebody you know twenty five dollars hundred dollars for a portrait take three days sitting there when you could get a very accurate probably more accurate portrait of somebody you know in fifteen seconds for a dime and of course portrait painters went into a crisis what do we do all painters went into a kind of a crisis because they could not compete with the speed and accuracy of a camera well you know, if you're, this is what happens, I think, with all technological innovations, any kind of innovation. It could be a cultural innovation as well. Uh, if you have somebody that comes up and has something new, fast, uh, more appealing to an audience, you really have two choices. One of them is to do what they do and do it better. But that's really hard because they were there first. Um, a good example of that is, um, well, uh, that, let me give the other option first. The other option is to do what they can't do. So for the first option, I think there are some examples of people who were late on the block, that somebody else come along and invented something first, and yet they came along and they beat them at their own game. Like the Koreans with automobiles. You know, they reverse engineered, uh, let's say, a German car or a Japanese car. They figured out how to improve what it had, add special features, and drop the price. The Koreans make terrific cars, and they're much cheaper than their competitors. It's hard to compete with Koreans now when it comes to cars. Uh, the Taiwanese, you know, uh, America used to be the silicon foundry capital of the world. We made all the great, powerful silicon chips. Uh, but then somehow along, the Taiwanese came along and, and they, they made them faster, better. And now they have the only silicon chip foundry that makes advanced chips in the world. You think about it. I mean, they beat us at our own game. Um, same thing happened with photography. Um, Kodak used to, you know, was the first to make really cheap and convenient cameras. There were little brownies that anyone could buy, and you know, for a buck, I think they were in 1900. Uh, now, you know, Kodak is basically a museum. So it's really hard to compete with somebody at their own game, and there's no way that poets could compete with digital technology. They could use it, they could exploit it, but they really couldn't compete with it. So what's the other option that you have? If you can't do what they do better than they do it, cheaper than they do it, uh, then you only real choice is to do what they can't do. So what could poets do that digital culture could not do? Well, this is another thing about that moment that I came in the late 90s. The same moment that the Taiwanese are going online saw the emergence of this incredible consumer culture that was right there. You know, it's not, I'm not talking about just you know, walls full of consumer products. I'm talking about consumer environments like Starbucks. I think the first Starbucks was the same year I arrived, 1997, it was in, uh, in Taipei. And then they soon spread because they're not just selling coffee, they're selling an atmosphere, you know, a kind of status, a kind of style, you know, fashion. And it was very appealing. So it's great to have, to go to a machine and get your coffee without having to talk to somebody in the, in the, uh, in the pay line. But it's even better to go into a place and feel like you're rich you know, or you're sophisticated, and hear jazz, you know, and get these wonderful treats. There's something about that consumer culture that encourage actually a kind of return to the material, physical, sensual, visceral things, collectibles, for example. The 90s also saw the emergence of the great uh, bookstore chain they have there called uh, Esli, Chungping. And they didn't just sell books, they sold an atmosphere. It was a great place to, to go and hang out. They uh, sold all kinds of consumer products. Um, you know, like museum gift shops. They would have all, a whole range of items, and it was a great place to go and socialize. They usually had a coffee, a couple of coffee houses inside of them. And so th at the same time as you're seeing all these people go online, um, you know, uh, for example, with blogs and other uh, uh, digital platforms, you had the emergence of this physical material culture. So poets were a little bit, a little bit annoyed at the poetry and poetry publishers were a little bit annoyed. and aggravated by the, uh, the emergence of things like poetry blocks, you know, because you could do that for free. And so a, a publisher like Hong Kong, for example, who's one of the great innovative poetry publishers, you know, you got a little concerned about this. You know, how do we get people to buy books, you know, uh, since they can read poetry online for nothing? So he got together with a bunch of other poets who also had this feeling that, you know, I really don't want to go digital. It's not where I want my work. Hung, I, that's not where I want my work consumed. I, I, I want books. And among those poets was Shayu, who has this whole box here. She's really the driving force, I think, behind the, what I'm going to talk about today. But she had many collaborators, uh, and one of them was Hong Hong. And together, 
they founded this incredible journal, which is still around, I think, uh, called Poetry Now, Xian Zai Shi. And it was inspired by um, the uh, original coterie modernist journal called Xian Dai Shi, Modern Poetry, which was the kind of premier journal in which innovative poets in the post-war era published their work. And many of these people became household names. But that journal fell apart. It, it collapsed in the 90s. In fact, the last editor was Hong Hong, who was one of the founding editors of Poetry Now. Anyway, they got together and they decided that they wanted to make a new uh, physical poetry journal, but they wanted it to be bigger and better and more innovative than anything else that had been around in order to appeal to this growing interest in consumer culture and material. You know, they, they wanted to, to revive the notion of the book and expand the, the idea of what, what poetry could be. So they came up with this journal, and, and, and they wound up publishing an issue. Was, the first one was in 2002, pretty much once a year, and they've done that, I think, ever since. I'm not sure if they've produced in the last couple of years, because most of what I'm talking about is between 2002 and 2015 when I left. So anyway, they came up with some great uh, ideas. Every single issue was completely different. My favorite is the, um, uh, the Poetry Now... Uh, Big Character poster series. Um, this is, uh, I think, really an amazing thing. It's a series of Da um, Zi Bao. Da Zi Bao is the name for the um, for the uh, posters that, during the Cultural Revolution, uh, that people would put up on on walls, and uh, they would they would. It was like a kind of a revolutionary uh, resistance from below. Uh, uh, and so this this uh, uh, became a, a huge phenomenon through mainland China in the 60s. And um, this was the sort of inspiration for that. They thought, well, they were also thinking of the rock posters of the 60s. So some of these poets, like Xia Yu and Hong Hong, they grew up in the, really grew up in the 70s, started writing in the 80s and early 90s. So they came up with this great idea. It was really Xia Yu's uh, brainchild called the Poetry Now. Um, great uh, big character poster. Every page is uh, a single poem, and it's a different poem by somebody. This is by Ling Yu, for example. And you can see that those are various, uh, those are images from, from the, the Da Zi Bao. So it serves um, both as a, um, as a wall poster, like this, um, where you can see it, but it's also a, a broadsheet kind of newspaper journal where you can read it just like any other journal. But it's physical, it's visually beautiful, it's something you can carry with you, and it's a collectible. You know, it's an object to, to keep. And I think part of the charm of all the issues that they produced is, it's, as a physical object, it's quite beautiful, sensual, attractive, and, and that's another reason to collect them. And so they actually made several versions, uh, uh, several different covers for the, the, the uh, big character poster when it came out, hoping that people would buy more than one copy of it, you know, for friends or whatever. So that's my favorite uh, of, of the series. But they had many others. For example, the the small character uh, character uh, issue, which did the reverse. There, what they did is they got little stamps that were carved out, and they would they would um, write poems and have them made into stamps, and they would print them on all kinds of things, like including an avocado or a piece of bread or whatever. Uh, Hong came up with this idea of the Poetry Now calendar, which I think is really cool. It's not a it's not a, a new idea. They've had them in the in the West for a long time, but it's Poetry Now daily calendar. I'm going to pass this around, and you can fan through. This was an international issue. It had uh, uh, they solicited poems from all the editors, and including me. I wasn't an editor, but I was kind of a consultant, and I helped them. Uh, uh, you know, I, I talked to poets and translator friends around the world, and. And so they were submitted uh, to this thing, and they included 365. I think it's, uh, I really like it. It's, it's done on um, this uh, really thin onion skin paper here. I want to pass that around. Some of the other issues that are kind of interesting were, oh, the scratch out issue here. Um, this, no, uh, cut it out, cut it out, cut it out. This is called negative poetry. This is also something that was kind of invented, I think, by the Dadaists, where you take an existing page of text or a poem, you cross out all the words you don't like, and you create a new poem that exists in there, and uh, maybe pass that around as well. You might find that interesting. 
Um, they had many, many other issues, which I don't have here. I, I don't know quite where all my issues went, but one of them, my, uh, another personal favorite, was the, uh, the pink uh, telephone book. They don't make telephone books anymore, I don't think. But uh, what it is is the poems were all published in the upper uh, left or right-hand corner, and then the rest of the page was filled with random sequences of numbers. It was an oversized book. It was completely pink, and um, Xiaoyu and Hong Hong and the other others sent out a call for, uh, for, for contributions, and they, and they had a, uh, a box, uh, a large box, which was placed outside of several of the asleep bookstores with a 48-hour deadline. So anyone coming in would see the sign, and then if they had a poem, they could pop it in there. Publication guaranteed. And they got something like 600 or 700 poems in 48 hours, which shows you that poetry was kind of a vital thing back in 2004 or 5 when it was, was done. And that issue was uh, tremendously popular and sold like hotcakes. So anyway, they're not the only people who are doing interesting things with book design, trying to revive new formats and uh, revive the book and, and come up with new formats for presenting poetry. Uh, some of the contributing poets were inspired by the Poetry Now Poetry Collective to come up with their own ideas. Um, well, uh, one of them is this uh, poet named Sha Sha. Sha Sha. Um, well, let me talk about Hong Hong first. Hong Hong was uh, the other driving force of the Poetry Now. Uh, he's a um, filmmaker, a theater director, a poet of his own right. He publishes uh, Dark Eyes. He's one of the, the big publishers of uh, innovative poetry. Uh, but he also uh, publishes books of his own. And this one is Tu uh, Zhi Dan, which means Homeland Bomb. It's a very political uh, collection that he wrote after visiting the Middle East. And um, the format of this book, I think, is really interesting. Normally, the books are, uh, have a vertical portrait format. This has a landscape format. And um, I really like that. I don't see very many of these, but I just love the, 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 the way it is. I'll pass this around in a few minutes. And it was in, this is, has a kind of interesting historical background. Uh, this format was inspired by the American Allied Services publications, which were this size. And there were millions of books that the US government published for soldiers fighting during World War II. And they were designed like this. It's basically half a book. And it's rather thin. It's designed like this so that soldiers, you know, in, in, during the war in, in the Pacific or in Europe, could fit this into their M1 clip, you know, where they kept their shells. It would fit in there with, with the bullets, so that you could you could carry ten or you know five or ten books with you, because being a soldier, you spend most of your time just sitting there. It gets boring, and so uh, so the American military published these things. Well, they many of them wound up in East Asia, you know, after the war was over, and um, the Chinese saw these books, and they came up with their own idea for this. Uh, let me put this down for a second. Um, and this became a tremendously popular propaganda tool for the the, the communist government in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. And they began making these wonderful comic books, I mean, beautifully illustrated. Uh, and the texts are quite good. This one, in fact, happens to be about uh, uh, one of the um, uh, Sino-Vietnamese conflicts, brief conflicts where they, I think it was Vietnam invaded Cambodia, so China invaded Vietnam and was very sorry they did because a lot of a lot of people died, and anyway, it's, it's quite a wonderful book. And anyway, uh, I found this in an old bookstore in Taipei, um, but uh, I thought the historical interest. I'm surprised that people don't do more of these. I think this would be a very nice uh, point of purchase selling uh, item. So anyway, Hong Hong is a pretty interesting uh, guy. He's uh, he teaches film. He uh, he curates the Taipei International Poetry Festival, in which he's brought in a lot of filmmakers. He's very interested in the impact of film, because this is another example of digital culture. It's not just getting online, but films. How does a poet, a book publisher, compete with a film? And uh, he wrote this um, wonderful uh, poem called The World. I won't, won't read the whole thing, but I thought the first part of it would give us an idea of the context of you know, what it's like in, in, to be in Taiwan in the late 90s, early, early, uh, early um, new millennium. It's called um, The World. The world is not outside. 
It's here, in these trailers, where every hour of the day, war and terror, love and laughter, pass before our eyes like ghostly apparitions. He's talking about the trailers in front of the film, uh, the theaters, the movie theaters uh, in Taipei, where they sh you can stand outside in the line, you see these trailers for all the movies that are playing at the current time. Of course, this is pre-COVID. I don't even know if they have these theaters anymore. So, and then it continues here. The world is here inside this endless spectacle of formulaic teasers. No need to even buy a ticket. You can stand here and watch them for hours. And in every single one, they all speak English. And there's another thing, I think, an, another, uh, I can say, technological innovation that uh, poets and poetry publishers are competing with. Let me pass this around. I really love this book. The uh, interior um, illustrations were done by uh, another poet I'm going to talk about in a minute. But, you know, so, I mean, this is the problem for, for anyone is trying to compete for the attention of a consumer. You know, I mean, think about yourself. Would you rather read a poetry book or would you rather watch a movie? Especially a big blockbuster movie, you know, uh, from the United States or France or Germany. You know, you, you, it's an uphill battle for, for, for poets, I think. And which is one of the reasons why so many poets have gone into filmmaking, including Hong Hong, as a way of packaging their, their work to make it more interesting for consumers. Now, one of the, I think, really interesting material um, solutions to, to uh, attracting the attention of potential readers is uh, Shasha. And Shasha came up with these wonderful novelty items for packaging poems. Like this, uh, you've seen these, I don't know if they, if they still have them anymore, but it's basically a, a candy dispenser. You put a quarter in or a dollar in or whatever it is, you, you crank it and then this thing pops out and inside is candy or a treat or you know a doll or something, or superhero or whatever it was. So she went and bought one of these machines and she got all these eggs and instead of filling them with candy or, or Marvel comic heroes, she filled them with poems, which she... Um, formatted herself and uh, designed, you know, uh, little uh, woodblock prints for, for making them quite attractive. And, and she usually wrapped them with something interesting, um, you know, like a, like a, something uh, like you maybe do for a hair, uh, tie back your hair, or she'd put in some other novelty item in. So you weren't just getting a poem, you were getting something else. Sometimes it was candy, in fact. And, and then she included very short poems on each of these. There were usually, I think there was a dozen t that she made totally. And so you'd put them in there, and then she'd have a list of all the poets' names. And I remember this very vividly, because the first time I saw this, I believe I was at, it was a uh, coffee house in Taipei. And I was sitting at the table trying to do a translation, and this gaggle of high school girls from Beinu, which is the premier female high school in, 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 in Taiwan were there. And they were at the machine and they kept putting in quarters. They kept putting in quarters. And, and this woman would, 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 would open it up and she'd look at it and then she'd throw it down. And then she'd put another quarter and she'd take it out. She kept doing it. She says, I'm looking for the Shaoyu poem, you know? And she finally got it after about seven or eight tries. And, uh, and uh, not a quarter, it was a uh, Taipei. It was a, a dollar, I guess. A hundred dollars or whatever it was. I can't remember the currency. but And then I just... I introduced myself and I said, well, I'm her translator, <laughs> you know, and uh, so they, they were, uh, but anyway, I was struck by that and then I thought, well, I've got to meet who this person is, Shasha. So uh, Hong Hong introduced me to her and uh, anyway, this is one of my favorites. It uh, also speaks on the topic here. It's by a, um, a Ming Dynasty uh, poet named, uh, um, is it, Gong uh, Zi. Uh, Zhen. And just the first two lines, it's Gu ren zhi zi gui ye lei No, gui ye qi Hou ren shi zi ba you ji So when the ancients um, basically invented writing, the ghosts cried. And the people ever after, uh, in learning to read or learning writing, learning writing. Uh, yoji, this is have, uh, have collected one depression after another. In other words, learning how to read and write is depressing. 
i thought that's a really interesting poem for somebody in the early nineteenth century to have written anyway another item she did was the poetry matchbooks um, which i thought were quite cool i don't have any matches left because the, they wouldn't let me take the matches through customs when i flew back from taiwan to the states so i had to take them all out but uh, you know, people, a lot of people in Taiwan smoke, especially when this came out around 2010. Um, and so matchbooks are, you know, something that people buy regularly. So what she did is, again, she did the same basic format in which she had an illustration, add a poem, stuck it in the matchbox with matches, and sold it as a box set. Uh, and I think it's really quite attractive. And she would sell this in, in at Chungping, I think is where she sold most of these. She had a lot of other novelty things, like poetry in a sleeve. Um, I can't quite remember what they are. And the months, uh, and, and there's uh, actually um, 13 of them in there, because the 13, uh, the Chinese traditionally have 13th months. They have a rei uh, yue, which means it's like the, um, what do you call it, the, um, the extra month you need every four years or so to for the days that you that because you know the, the um, what, what do we call it in, in English what the leap year? yeah it's like the leap month uh, they don't have a leap year they have a leap month every year so anyway so um, so this is basically um, the the center of a movement uh, of revival of poetry books so when Poetry Now came out, a lot of other people who wanted to be poets or already poets became inspired to, uh, to, to do really interesting things with their publications, not just to publish in a conventional format, but to come up with uh, uh, their own ideas for presenting their work. Um, and most of these people are self-published. And the greatest of them all, I mean, the, the, the real genius behind this uh, uh, return to, to, to the book as a material object is Sha Yu. Uh, she's one of the first poets I've ever, ever translated. And that was another, another lucky thing of my arrival in the late 90s. Uh, at the end of the 90s, I'd tried to translate her work before I'd written her in Paris. Uh, she lived there. She lived there for many years. Um, and she wrote me back saying, you know, I, I think translation is, it's pointless, you know. My work can't be translated. Um, you know, I've looked at the translations that other people have done, and I hate them, you know, and so I'm really sorry, but, you know, bye-bye. And, but anyway, she, that, a, a year later, she came back to Taiwan in order to publish this book, Salsa, which, uh, whoops, is my uh, favorite, and the first of her books that I published in its entirety. I don't have a copy of it here. I thought Jonathan would have one, but, um, and I didn't bring one of my own. So she was coming back. And she was still uh, typing up and proofreading. She just learned how to type. She had never learned to type before. Um, so she was just typing up the, the manuscript. When Hong Hong said, no, 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 you got to meet Steve Bradbury. He translated some of my poems. And uh, I really like what he did with them. I think you should talk to him. You know, he, I think he's, he would be a good translator. So we got together in a coffee house in Taipei. In fact, it was at, at, at Aslead. And I remember you know, we, when we f first sat down, she was like, sitting there with her arms crossed. You know, her body language is basically telling me, you know, why are you wasting my time? You know, what are you, you know? <laughs> and so I began to talk about, you know, what I, she said, why do you want to translate my work? And I explained, you know, what I liked about it. The musicality, the fact that it's very open-ended, um, and I think I could do some interesting things with that. And so as I talked, she began to relax, and finally she's kind of like, got her hands on her hips, and then she's elbows on the tables, and then she's leaning forward. And she says, I'm, I'm working on my new book. And she put out her manuscript of all the typed up pages with all the corrections, because she was a terrible typist. And she says, I'll make you a copy and I'll give it to you tomorrow. And she dropped it off the next day. And I started translating and publishing translations from Salsa before the book, her own book appeared. Um, and that was 20 years ago. And I'm still doing her work. Um, I'm, I'm, I feel terribly guilty, though, because I haven't done a book in a long time. I'm working on a new book now. Anyway, so the, the, one of the interesting things about this book, Salsa, is that it's got what they call deckled edges, which means they never trimmed it. So 
It's a very difficult book to fan. It doesn't fan the way it normally does. I'd like to pass it around. Um, and it was decal, it was not, not only was it uncut, but you had to take a, let's say a pair of scissors or a knife, and you had to cut the pages to read half the poems. So this is my, the first edition that I had, and you can see it was awfully, I mean, it wasn't very good with a pair of scissors. But um, that was one of the features that she did. The other is that she published vertically, which people had stopped doing in Taiwan for about a decade or so. They were publishing horizontally. And the third thing is she included a lot of art that she did. Um, there, there's images in there, so I'm going to pass this book around, including an image, which I have a blow up of here. These are uh, scans of a painting she did when she was living in Paris. She was really into goats because uh, there's something, um, she, I don't know, as an animal form or spirit, uh, she resonates uh, a lot with goats. Anyway, that became the, uh, I used that as a, for the postcard that I used as a promotional postcard for my first book of her uh, first uh, collection of, of her poems, which was Fusion Kitsch. That's this one here in the corner. Um, and this book, and so I, me and my uh, designer used it for the cover of this volume here. So I'll pass us also around because I think it's a kind of an interesting book. It, one of um, Shayu's, um, you can see that she's. This is a self-portrait that she did of her as a boxer, but also kind of sexy. And she wants to engage with readers in a kind of physical way. And one of the ways you do that is with a book. I mean, a book is a very intimate object. Um, let's take uh, this one out here. You know, books provided the first, especially for women, they provided the first privacy that women ever had. Because normally, you're not allowed to go out and run around and go out on the streets and stuff. You're stuck in the house, and there's usually somebody else there. But when you open a book, and you start reading, it requires almost 100% of your consciousness. And so the world around you disappears. And the only world that exists... Ah, she... <laughs> yeah, I think she's saying something to me. <laughs> um, is the world that you're reading about. If you've read Jane Eyre, um, you might remember that when she wants to read. She goes into the little window archive where she can sit, draws the curtain so nobody can see her, and she can see, look outside the window and see the landscape, or she can read in her books, and then she's taken... I mean, it's basically a time and space machine. It takes you somewhere else, away from where you are. So books had this wonderful uh, way of uh, allowing you to escape from whatever environment you had, troubles, worries. But they also are... It's a very physical thing, because you touch it, you feel it, you... You know, the smell of a book. There's even a word for that, vermicore. It's based on the idea of ikor, the food of the gods. Verma means vellum, which is, you know, the early, uh, uh, you know, pre-paper, um, lambskin. It's physical, but it makes a noise when you turn it, you know. Uh, and then the shape, and it's, it's something you can hold, you can hold to your chest. So Shayu has always made books with the idea that it's a very intimate way that she and her reader can connect. And all her books are designed not only to, to um, you know, um, engage the reader, but to encourage them to participate in the collaboration that reading is. So her poems are deliberately open-ended, and the only way you can really make sense of it is to project your own thoughts and ideas into it. So, in a sense, the reader and the, and, and the author make whatever poem that is together. That's why she, she actually had some advice from me early in our relationship. She said, Steve, don't paraphrase what I'm saying, or what you think I'm saying. Translate what I wrote, because readers need their freedom. You know, I shouldn't be coming along and telling the reader what to think. Let the reader decide what to think, because every reader is going to come up with a different poem, really, when they do that. And one of the things she likes to do is slow them down, though. You know, I mean, we're in an age now where everything is speeding up. She wants to slow them down force them to, um, you know, to take time to do something. She also likes the idea of, of individualing, individualizing objects. And one of the ways she did that is this particular collection, which is called Shi Liu Shi Shou, uh, poems, 60 of them, is 
the whole it's designed, the cover is the latex covering that you use on the scratch things, on lottery cards, you know, and on your, on your um, used to be on credit cards, you have to sc scratch off latex. So what happens is that, uh, you know, each person can, um, you know, can, can individualize their own copy. Here's, a, here's someone else that was posted online, is that they sort of scratched a cloud in the middle of it. The first issues were in silver and black, and this is my copy, my first, first uh, copy of it. And I individualized by saying, every time it rains, I think of you. Because shayu is a homophone, and it's a word that has the same sound as to rain. You know, shayu, raining. Um, and uh, anyway, so uh, I'll pass this around. I'm working on that now. I should have that book finished by the end of the year. I've also thrown in some translations, which uh, uh, I thought maybe it might be interesting. She's, uh, she's a very in-your-face kind of poet, and she doesn't kid around. And she's shameless, you know, in what she's willing to say and do. So I thought I'd read a really short poem from that. It's called, um, and also she's very ohua, which means her language is very much in the style of Western writing, syntax, uh, and she often takes English texts and tr translates them back into Chinese to make poems. And this is an example of what she did that. Um, the, the, the title of the poem is, You Are a Dog, I Am Your Bitch, which is a, an idiom, you know, uh, that we have in English, not something you'd want to say generally in mixed company. So she did a little translation of that. Which has a very different feel than, it's not nasty, it's just, it's kind of like, it's, anyway. So the poem goes like this. The, the translation goes like this. The gods are everywhere. Prayer gets you nowhere. The cockiest of all is dog. He has no interest in finding himself. He finds himself a bite to eat, and then he finds another dog. He sniffs about, he wags his tail, and I interpret what he says as this. Perfect. I am a dog, you are my bitch. That's uh, shy, very much in your face. So um, she got some newer publications. She's actually better known as a songwriter, or rather her songs are better known than her poems. She's one of the most prolific songwriters in the Chinese-speaking world, and she's been writing poems since the 80s. And uh, in fact, you may even know some of her, of her songs. Uh, there's, uh, my favorite is, uh, I'm ugly, but I'm tender. And this is like this huge hit that everyone knows all over the Chinese-speaking world, you know. So she's written a lot of, uh, she doesn't write under the name Shai, she writes under the name uh, Li Gadi. So eventually what happened is she decided that, um, at the urgence of a lot of fans, that she published her song lyrics. And she designed them in beautiful ways. This is a black and white edition of them. And as you can see, the text is quite different and rather difficult to read. It's going to slow you down. But the book is quite beautiful. It came out with black and white versions as well as um, color version. The color version is actually the most interesting because it's a, um, what do we call this, a, uh, a match? What do, you, what do you call that? It's, uh, you know, you can, you can, uh, um, you, can uh, alt, you can take the top of one, song and you can mix and match with other songs so you can sort of do that yourself because the book is the text i mean the pages within the book are are cut so you can mix and match your own poems but then all uh, all the pages are have a different design her designer by the way her co-designer humichi uh, was also the person who helped her design the the big poetry um, poster series and uh, the 60 poems collection that you have here and this book. But the most interesting thing that she, oh, let me pass that around. The most interesting thing that she's done, I think, and the one that people have written about the most is called Pink Noise. Pink Noise, I don't know if you know that, Fan Hong Zhao Yin. Pink Noise is actually um, a pleasant form of white noise. Probably heard of white noise machines. People have tinnitus, they can't sleep. You get a white noise machine. That's actually pink noise. Pink noise is a particular fre frequency band among noise. And so she always wanted to do a book that was transparent. So she published this with the, it's got a, uh, 
slip cover and it's got this advertising wrap around and um, and the entire book is made of transparent acrylic now she didn't it's called pink noise what she did is she was just just started to learn to get online it's about 2008 2010 when she's doing this she's learning to browse online and she had a computer an old Macintosh computer which had a translation um, uh, function in it called Sherlock, as in Sherlock Holmes. So what she would do is she would get on English and French blogs and she would p call lines, steal lines from the internet, and then put them together. And then she'd run it through the computer translator to turn it into Chinese. And the Chinese and the English are, you know, completely alienated from each other. Um, and so it's really like three books. It's the English poem she wrote in English, and then there's the Chinese translations the computer uh, came up with. If she didn't like the translation, she would rewrite the English and then do it again until she came up with them. And she's usually writing four or five poems at the same time. And then there's the differences between the two. So anyway, this book was so popular. This is the first edition, actually. There was something like, I don't know how many copies. It was, it was on sale for 700 NT, which is a lot of money in you know 2009, I guess, was when it was done. Um, and it sold out within 48 hours. And then the, she did a second edition with an English translation of the, uh, the, the afterword that sold out within a few months. And now it's a huge collector's item, so I'll pass that around. You can't really read it without putting something under it. So let me give you one of the promotional cards that she made. Um, you know, they, they would put them at the, you know, where the cash register were as an advertising form. So anyway, some of her more recent books are she puts out an anthol I mean a, a selected um, uh, shayu, which often has photographs. There's a photograph of her there. You can see she's a very lovely lady. Uh, but every time she publishes a new edition of this, she changes the contents. She doesn't like selected ideas. Um, this is a, her one of her newest books, which I'm about halfway through, called Romance as Enlightenment. You can see it's got a very engaging cover. Um, and then this is a photo journal. She went to Paris and spent, um, I don't know, uh, a month or two, made hundreds and hundreds of photos on a cheap Japanese camera. And then she went through and she put them into a narrative form and wrote a line for each photo. Um, I translated this book in 2016. Um, and it comes with, I'll show you. It's really hard to, kind of hard to read the text. And if you want to just read the poem, at the very back of the book is a mini version of it. And the te it's just pure text. It's a book within a book. So every one of her books is quite different. They're tremendously popular uh, consumer items, collectibles, I guess you could say. She's one of the few poets in the world who actually makes a living from her poetry, although she mainly depends on, on um, on poem series. She's very popular in mainland China, apparently, because the Chinese published a box set of five of her books. Um, and um, the, But the difference between their publications and hers is that these are in a uniform format. She, they use the same type font for every single poem, every single book, and it loses something. You know, it's not quite the same item. I completely forgot to talk about her, these books over here. Uh, her I think these are really interesting. Um, this is her first book, which was she repudiates because it's um, she regards it as juvenilia, uh, juvenalia, I guess is the pronunciation, as uh, you know, kid stuff. And uh, but it's um, been immensely popular, but she refuses to reprint it. So what happens is it's created a kind of uh, underground publishing. Uh, where people mimeograph other people's copies. Mine is a copy of a copy of a copy. It used to be, uh, I was a copy of Amy Perry's, which was a copy of somebody else's. And um, and it's a rather primitive book. She made it herself, and it, the typeface is rather primitive. Um, her next book was much more sophisticated and included art and beautiful typography and beautiful uh, fonts in it. It's just a gorgeous book to hold and smell and feel. Um, all of these books, except for the first one, have been continuously in print. This one is her first artist book. 
uh, which is, and you can see how beautiful the way it's, it's beautifully it's done. This was also uh, deckled pages. Um, they, um, you know, where, where you had to basically cut through the, the book to see it. I think this is a really gorgeous piece of publishing. So anyway, these people inspired a lot of other younger, younger writers. And um, one of the ones that I translated is Yemi Mi. Recently, she started this thing called Poetry Taro, Spiritual Counseling. Um, she's studied film at the Chicago Art Institute. Um, she actually studied film first under Hong Hong, who's a rather well-known filmmaker, as well as a poet and publisher. Um, she sent me her first book, which was published in 2004 in the mail, with a note from um, a poet that I was translating at the time called Shang Qin. Shang Qin is regarded in many ways as a sort of spiritual godfather of the Poetry Now Collective, because he's one of the first poets to, in, to include art in his books, his own art, drawings and stuff, and to use unconventional formats. These are some of his calligraphy and paintings. And to write in very unconventional ways. A lot of people refer to him as a surrealist. I'm not quite sure that's the best label to use for him, but his writing is very different than the average uh, confessional, uh, you know, modern confessional poet. And he was a wonderful man and a teacher as well. And he was, um, he wasn't a teacher of you know, I mean, so much as a mentor. Anyway, she sent me a copy of this book called Chihei. It's pitch Black. It's, Chihei is the, the title. Um, and, you know, I, I, I really like the, photo the photographs in here. Let's see if I can find some. Well, there aren't too many photographs in here, but uh, I, I kind of like the, the book design, and I love some of the design features, like the accordion fold-out page. I thought that was interesting. But by chance, the the... I was getting a lot of books from young poets who wanted me to translate them. And by chance, the poem I opened to, which I read, didn't really appeal to me. And so I put it on a shelf and quickly forgot about her. Uh, but then two years later, I, I was at the Dragon Boat, um, uh, uh, Dragon Boat Festival poetry reading, Duanwujie, poetry reading, I think at, at Wisteria, which is a big tea house in Taipei. And I heard her read a poem that just blew me away. And I thought, whoa! Who is this? And then she came up afterwards. No, I went up to her afterwards and said, you know, who are you? You know, this is, this is an amazing poem. And this is the poem that she read, I think, uh, which is still among my favorites. It's not very long. It's called, um, the Chinese is uh, Yang Guang Xu Xian. So, sunlight's dotted line. The pace of the snapshot is bovine. Black dogs bend an ear the whole a.m. A solitary someone at the rim of the world is gleaning something. Nearby summits, structure without rhyme or reason. Lilies sing the spring presumptive. Coral tree blossoms sicken a breast. Women refurbish their skin on sandy beaches. A plumped up oil drum. We on sunlight's dotted line hold open our palms to read a word you cannot see the end of. Practice facing the sea. Focus on facing off a score of smiles. Practice your haiku by ear. Slope of sawtooth grass, bevy of ring doves, floating conversation, beer. S haiku is 17 syllables, right? Mm -hmm. um, Later, from his pocket, he fumbles up a lump of ice, subliming as vapor and warm time. Thus, she's like a flight of driftwood, arriving at the stern. Rain, when it falls, they merge, become one, to help the briny waves turn the page. It's not your conventional, uh, confessional poetry. Anyway, I was blown away. and. I love the wordplay and the musicality and, and the inventiveness of it. So anyway, uh, I, I translated a chapbook of her work called um, His Days Go By the Way, His Years, which is long out of print, and I feel guilty to have not done more. And she went on to publish a lot of other really interesting books in interesting formats. This one is filled with photographs. Uh, let's see. 
It's filled with photographs, and uh, it's, it's a combination of prose poems, uh, uh, personal notes. Here's a wonderful photograph from when she was in Chicago at the Art Institute um, of Boots in the Street, and it came with its own wraparound cover. So, yeah, me, me. So last but not least is Amang, the poet that I just translated. Um, could you get the books out for me, Jonathan? Amang is equally interesting. Uh, like Yemi Mi, she's really into musicality. Uh, she makes poetry films, and she's uh, she channels her poetry. I mean, uh, they're not the kind of people to sit down and think, well, I want to write a poem about a tree. Uh, it kind of pours through them, and, and so they, they write a lot. And they never revise, which is, I think, rather unusual. Um, so I, I, I met Amang in 2007. Um, Hong Hong recommended that uh, she meet me and, rec and then suggested that I get together with her, and I liked her poetry. I didn't translate very many poems before I left Taiwan in 2015, but I was very impressed with her first book, um, which I'm going to pass around because uh, one of it, this is brown sandpaper. She's clearly a poet who likes to leave an impression. And, um, and of course, the, the format is so unusual. The text is so beautiful. I was just sort of blown away by the book. She gave it to, to me at my first meeting, and I started translating some of her poems. But it wasn't until 2016, after she was just, uh, she'd published this, this book in mainland China, which is a much more conventional book with conventional typography. Uh, rather disappointing, I think, after this book. And um, she was in the midst of making this third book, which uh, Hong Hong, by the way, is the publisher of, which includes a lot of her photographs and many of her poems. We got, both got invited to the, um, let me uh, pass this around. We both got invited to the Vermont Studio Center in Johnson, Vermont, thanks to uh, a, a big fellowship from the Henry Luce Foundation, which flew her there and flew me there. And we spent a month in this idyllic uh, environment uh, translating. And so I was working on a new book. And we started this book, Raised by Wolves, Conversations, uh, Poems and Conversations, which was published last year and which this year won the 2020 Pan America Translation Award um, last, I think, April. So we were up there, you know, in this beautiful place, and she didn't want to get down, get together in, in the studios and talk about, you know, the, our offices or in the cafeteria. She wanted to go up in the mountains because she's, uh, she was, well, raised by wolves, you know, and, and she's a nature girl. So we would hike up 40 minutes into this hemlock forest, and we'd talk for an hour about the poems and conversations. And she's an alpha female, you know, and... Uh, she didn't like something I'm doing or something I'm translating. She'd let me know, you know, and uh, and uh, the conversations were were you know there, we wrestled a lot about you know how to render something in English because for years she was an English teacher. English is pretty good, uh, maybe maybe as good as my Chinese. I don't know. Uh, so we'd talk back and forth in, in the two languages, but uh, she had so many things she said that were about her poems or my translations or about the differences between. Chinese poetry and English poetry, or Chinese language and English, that I started surreptitiously recording our conversations on our, on my cell phone, because you know she said so much that was interesting, and I wanted. And then I came up with the idea: well, why don't we include some of the conversations in our book? And that's what we did. So it's got over 30 translations and about 30 pages of conversations, plus a lot of um, uh, some of my art. Um, you know, like um, this is a, a drawing I did of the Gihon River, which flows through Johnson. I did that at night. Uh, it's illuminated by a street light. And then a lot of her photographs, um, or photographs of her. And, uh, and I think that's part of the, I mean, the, the, I think the format of this book, the fact that it includes conversations between the poet and the translator, uh, make it more intimate and make it more, give it a context. To, to, to make it more engaging. So it's in an attempt, I'm trying to do what they're trying to do. How do I attract uh, poetry readers in an age in which people don't really want to read poetry? And I think it was a, they did a pretty good job with that. So anyway, those are the, the poets that I translate and the, 
and what I observed there. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say that, you know, this kind of uh, book-centered poetry initiative is, people now, it's almost routine that people will get a designer to help them with their books. So that's become, in many ways now, a convention. So what are the new ways in which poetry is, in a sense, how, do, how we get poetry out there, how do we engage a consumer? And I think that's films, the poetry films. And both Yemimi and Amang, as I mentioned before, they make poetry films in which they take a poem. In fact, there are, she's made three or four poems that, uh, of poetry films that are the poems in, in our book. And, um, and I think that's kind of a, a new, new way for that. The other way I think is, I'm really not quite sure, but I think poets are, again, in a kind of crisis and they're looking for ways in which to, to reach out to, you know, um, align poetry with something that's uh, something else, poetry plus, in order to draw on readers. I think I'm done.